Oh, hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to today's session and Speak Your Mind, a method that I'm sure we're all very, very curious about. And um, my name is Nellie Deutsch and I'm going to be moderating this session. And um, our speaker is here, I presume. Okay, great. So I'm going to pass on the mic to you uh, just to make sure that uh, I don't mispronounce your name. Because <laughs> I think I did already. Um, so, um, hope this up. We can hear you. I passed on the mic. And just to make sure. So, whenever you uh, get the mic, just uh, introduce yourself so we can hear your name properly. Uh, and everyone else, Thank you, Jesse, for letting that in the chat box where you're from so we can get an idea of uh, the distance that we've traveled in this online class. And I don't see uh, your webcam. Um, and I don't hear your voice. Yes, I hear, yes, at a distance. Hello. I don't want to mispronounce your name, so can you just uh, introduce yourself and then I'll sit. It's all black, isn't it? Uh, are you using... Yeah, we Hi, hear you I'm really well. Okay, so it's Ian McAnally. Perfect. Ian McAnally. Makes a lot of sense. I was just confused with the L and the I. Okay, so Ian, can you do me a favor? I know you can hear me. Um, there is a delay. I, in, um, <laughs> um, can you perhaps try to uh, set your login or... Uh, refresh the page. I don't know how long you've been waiting for the class to begin, but there is a, a device setting uh, just above my webcam, or in your case, just above the uh, the dark black area. Yeah, there's an icon. If you could go in there and make sure that you've got the right settings for your audio and your video. And if you're using a Mac, which I am, I think it's better with Firefox. Okay, you are. All right, so let me just introduce you, and um, if you could just... Yeah. Okay, uh, so Ian... That's okay. It's just technology, no big deal. Um, but sometimes we all face challenges. So if you could just uh, maybe refresh the page. I don't know if you know where to refresh it, but you might want to step out yeah, and step back in. Yes, it is, Jesse. Technology is wonderful if we just don't fret. Or uh, Oh, there we see you coming through. Wonderful. Okay, so video streaming is coming through now. And the rest should be coming, I think, that Ian's just... So let me just um, introduce our speaker, Ian, for today. And I'm really excited to love speaking my mind, or at least hearing my students speak their mind. So this is me. Um, I've been teaching English as a foreign language forever. I mean, I was before I was born, actually. That's why I say 30-plus years, but it's been longer. Ian is a teacher. He's a writer and co-founder of Speak Your Mind very powerful method of learning English. And let's see. My voice is coming. It's probably there's a delay. 
And this is um, an independent organization. The method is used in countries around the world, specifically in nine countries, in nine different language schools. And we're going to learn more about it from Ian, who's trying to set it. And, and this is just an example. You'll be seeing a YouTube video uh, later on to demonstrate how it works. And you know what? Maybe we should start with this right now. Okay, maybe we should just uh, begin with the video just to get an idea of what it's about. If you want to get in touch with Ian, uh, you just Google Speak Your Mind English and uh, you'll get there. Okay, so let me just, um, Ian, I'm going to try again to pass on the uh, tools to you. And if it takes long, it means there's probably a problem. Oh, CM already. S-Y-M. Jesse, maybe you can share um, what you're writing over there. I'm not sure that everyone knows. The chat box is a great place to uh, interact. So feel free to use the chat box as if you're speaking, uh, not in a classroom. Don't think that you're disturbing anyone. And at the end, you'll be able to copy the chat and all the information that's there and paste it anywhere, in a notebook, uh, in an email post to yourself, a Word document, and so on. So it's a great way to interact, so feel free to use it. Uh, Jesse says, so sorry, speak your mind. Is a <laughs> oh, Okay, thank you, Jesse. S-Y-M, okay? I just learned something. Thank you. Tata wants to, um, I want to be an English teacher in a few years. Okay, great. That's how you start. Okay, so let me just share the video with you to give you an idea of the system and how it works. Uh, this is a video that has been recommended. So just let me know if you can hear it.
Okay, um, I think that um, I'll just um, stop the. Uh, okay, I stopped the uh, the video. Yes, yes, that sounds Hello, can you? perfect, Ian. Yeah, I think your sound is coming through. Uh, not so much um, perfect. Uh, okay, 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 great. Yes. Good. All right. I'm glad to be here finally. Um, I'm having no, trouble hearing talking. now. That's, that's the only why. Thing. Um, when I don't talk, you won't hear anything. In other words, everybody, people, it's hard to conceive this, but everybody's in different places around the world. So even though they can hear one person at a time, we can't hear them unless I give the mic to everyone. So um, when you speak, you won't hear me. And if you do hear me, okay, perfect. Just, no, no, if, that's great. If you yeah, hear me, that's... it's not a good thing. So um, welcome. Welcome, Ian. And uh, thank you for pronouncing your name for me. And you were saying something about the origin of the name? No, no. No, the problem is I can't hear you when you are speaking. That, that's, the, that's the problem. Oh, you, I you see. All right. So um, tell me if it's better now. Yeah, I'm hearing nothing yeah, at the moment. Yeah, there's a delay. Okay, let me, let me do this. First of all, I'll, um, I'll just get audio from you since um, there's a delay of some kind. Okay, so um, Ian, I'll stop the... Um, the video. Okay, and um, it should be better. Is it better now? Just something else as well. I'll. Um, yeah, that, I, 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 it's better now, isn't it? Now I can hear you, but I mean, before I could hear you, then it would disappear, then come back, which of course is, is I was, I guessed you were speaking because you cut off mid-sentence. Um. All right, so I'm going to mute my mic, okay? When, uh, when you want me to speak, uh, you can also mute your mic since the connection is um, slow. So, Ian, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started? because I wanted to hear you. Okay, let's try something else. I'm going to uh, get rid of my uh, video. Um, maybe that'll help. Okay, mm -hmm. so let me stop right video. And then I'm going to refresh the page, which always helps, okay? And then, and then, okay, I've removed my video, and I've refreshed the page. So, Ian, you should be able to uh, uh, hear me clearly now. Is that correct? Yeah, I can hear you now. I've heard you for more than seven seconds, which is quite an achievement, because before I was getting five-second bursts and then 20 seconds of silence. So, fingers crossed. All right. We've got over Perfect. that problem. Okay, great. So, yeah, it's, it's flowing now. It's, it's fluent. Okay, great. So, can you tell us a little bit about your name? Uh, you started mentioning something about uh, originally it was... Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing anything at the, pre at the moment here. No, I'm afraid it's just silence once more here. 
All right, so listen, we don't need to hear me. We need to hear you because it's about you. So if you could perhaps uh, tell us about the method, how you got involved, why you got involved, and so on. Okay, well, I hope I can do this and without uh, too many interruptions because I imagine it's extremely frustrating to sort of hear bits and pieces. Um, so. Let me know if, if my voice fades. No, we hear you perfectly. Well, I mean, I, I came into teaching, I think, like lots of people. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, I, I originally I was a teacher. I mean, I hadn't uh, set out to be a teacher, uh, but I think like lots of lots of other people, it became an, a very attractive option when I finished uh, university. Um, I, went, I went into teaching. I was given a job job uh, in Italy, which took me to the north of Italy, and then to Rome. I worked in various schools. After two or three years of that, I decided it was time to return to the UK and settle into a different kind of career. Uh, that I thought, didn't prove very successful. Those were the, the, the famous Thatcher years where kind of unemployment was rocketing, uh, yeah, like the present uh, perhaps. So teaching again became an option that I uh, kind of returned to. Uh, I returned to and I I came over to, to Italy um, with my, my 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 wife, my partner, who I'd met when I was a teacher in, in London, and uh, I started giving private lessons, and the number of students that uh, I was teaching grew and grew and grew, and. It, made sense at that point to actually to start a school. Now, at this stage, I'd been, the first job I had when I started teaching was with uh, a very, now it's a very large school, has been a large school in London, which used what uh, was a very sort of uh, muscular kind of audiolingual course. Uh, it was fairly different from what other schools were using, but it was sort of remarkably popular with, uh, with students. Um, these were the days of uh, when communicative teaching was uh, on the up, and but this this survived as a sort of a remnant from uh, from from a previous generation. And like I said, it did seem very popular. I mean, everybody who worked with it was very aware of all the weaknesses and so on. But you know, unless you're under the illusion that you're going to find something perfect, you have to take faults into into account. So, you know, as a teacher, you are prepared to overlook the faults and perhaps just uh, and, and focus on what was good. So I, I was using this as a basis when I started teaching uh, in the school that I had started. Um, of course, I was very curious. I had become very curious in teaching in my sort of, uh, I had other teaching experiences in different schools. I was always interested in talking about teaching to, to other teachers and, and uh, reading, investigating find out as much as possible. So I couldn't help be a little frustrated, if you like, with the shortcomings which have been evident as a teacher, but once you have the greater responsibility of, uh, of running a school, you have to be a bit more long-sighted and your scope becomes a little bit larger. Uh, so I began really uh, experimenting with ideas that I, I'd looked at that I would like to, uh, what I wanted to incorporate into, uh, into this idea that uh, I was working with. Uh, and really, from that point onwards, the school that I had started, and it actually grew pretty rapidly, really, became, uh, all, my, all my students, without their realizing it at first, became guinea pigs. Uh, and they sort of stayed guinea pigs, <laughs> happy guinea pigs, but uh, they, they stayed guinea pigs. And the teachers, in their turn, they were sort of all part of this sort of ongoing uh, uh, evolution, if you like, this constant development of the course. But again, um, one thing that had always been important to me as a teacher, uh, obviously if you're a teacher, I say obviously, but I mean, I think for most teachers, the rewards come from uh, the students. I mean, we all teach for students, without the students, of course, what, what are we doing uh, in the classroom? Um, so everything that has been done has really been towards giving the students uh, as close as possible as to what you know from experience or what your intuition tells you that they want. 
Uh, and of course, that's an incredibly complex thing. I mean, no one is trying to pretend that languages are simple, and no one is trying to pretend that uh, learning is a simple process, or that learners themselves are simple people. Now, the fact that all those things are not simple shouldn't, in my opinion anyway, shouldn't sort of uh, make us believe that the learning process can't be made as simple as it can be for the people who come to school. Um, their aims, most, my experience again, um, we're, we're talking here about a private language school, we're not talking about uh, uh, state schools, primary schools, university colleges, we're not talking about teaching people in lecture halls. Uh, we're talking about the circumstances, which are very common circumstances throughout the world, uh, private language institutions which are able to uh, teach small classes. So I'm not pretending that uh, this is something that can be applied in any teaching situation. I think it's very important to demark your zone of operation. Um, so the kind of people who do come to, to private language schools, they tend to have uh, fairly simple aims. And if you ask people what they want to do, they'll all say, well, I want to speak English. Again, that's a simple aim. Um, if you ask them how long they would like to spend learning English, they're going to say, well, uh, not too long, please. Um, people do have them fairly simple aims, of course, uh, then they'll have specific branches within those aims, people will be then using English in different sorts of circumstances. Uh, but those are areas that you define as you, as you progress. So, again, all these people coming to a school from all different walks of life, from uh, different ages and backgrounds, I mean, in the end, I, I mean, I was always more aware of uh, similarities, if you like, uh, what people have in common than I was by their, their differences. So I've not taken the route uh, of trying to separate people, divide them up, and to sort of fragment the way that languages are taught, but to sort of exploit uh, what that commonness is. I mean, people, again, tend to have fairly similar aims. People tend to respond to the same things. Um, people like to, to have a lesson in which they're involved. Uh, again, if people want to learn speaking, they like a lesson which puts the emphasis firmly on that, uh, which is then why language schools which are able to assure small groups that's the ideal uh, sort of format for, for many language courses, but this one also in particular. People like to have humour in their lessons, I find. These are sort of fairly uh, sort of common, fairly, I don't like the word universal, but uh, I think you know where I'm coming from. Um, so people do have an awful lot in common, uh, and over the years, because really, I mean, this has taken me 20 years of, of, of refinement of work and so on, it is to, to, to draw in all those separate strands that, uh, that we all see to, to come up with a, a, a course which is going to be as close as possible uh, to meeting people, typically your typical user, because I think, you know, we can talk about uh, uh, of a class of typical users, uh, their needs and their preferences. And of course, like I said, that sounds a very simple aim. Uh, the fact that it's a very complex material, uh, I don't think that should sort of stop us from trying to, to simplify the whole process so the person sitting in class uh, isn't being baffled, confused, or distracted. Uh, they're able to learn in a way that they find fairly intuitive, fairly easy. That's very important. Uh, and of course, another aspect of this I mentioned earlier, people, they want to learn, but they don't want to spend ages. So it's a question of going back to an idea which fell out of fashion, uh, uh, in the, probably with, along with the, the birth, if you like, of communicative teaching, which would be the idea of efficiency, which, uh, again, uh, efficiency is a word that we approve of in lots and lots of things. Uh, it's an idea that is sort of resisted by some areas of, of, of teaching circles. No, okay, I kind of waffled on a bit there, and I hope that was sort of clear enough. Uh, so everything really has been guided by, by the students, okay? Uh, that's what we're here for, that's what we're in the classroom for, that's what perhaps a lot of the schools are, are, are there for. 
Uh, so they're at the center of, of everything. Now, I hope you heard that because um, <laughs> I went on for quite a long time. I hope I wasn't talking uh, to Ian, myself. We can hear you. Uh, the question is whether you can hear me. We hear you. Hello? Or can you hear me? Um, did, okay, I've, um, oh. We heard everything. You can hear. Oh, great. I'm glad to know that. Oh, good. <laughs> I had this dreadful idea that I'd spend the last four or five minutes or a kind of a, a monologue to no one. That wouldn't have been a whole lot of use. No, the only person that can't hear is you. I don't know if you can read my lips. Okay. Can you read my lips? I will, yeah. I can read your right. lips. All right. If you promise to speak that, so. All right, so um, I, we heard everything. I have a question. I noticed that in the demonstration class, the class is very small. How large or small, what size should a class be? What kind should a class be? Uh, now, again, it depends on the modality, it depends on the circumstances you're teaching. Um, now, I mean, we're specifically looking at developing sort of speaking skills. We're looking at people becoming confident with a language. We want them to feel that it's theirs. Uh, now, of course, perhaps in that case, we're catering for the privileged few, if you like, who are able to attend uh, private language courses or who are lucky enough to be in some other kind of educational institution where they are able to study in small groups. Um, if I have a large class attempting to develop conversational skills, you know, that's not an ideal situation. Um, so most private schools, uh, you know, are able to assure standards in theory uh, they are able to ensure the right kind of conditions for, for learning. So that goes, I think that kind of goes without saying then that I mean, if, if a group is going to, to, to focus on, on, uh, on, on speaking skills, you do need to be realistic about at what point that doesn't become feasible any longer. Um, at our school, in right from the very early days, uh, we realized that small groups were a huge advantage. At the, at the time, they were the sort of golden days, I think, of English schools, certainly in Europe. I mean, the schools who were our competitors, we were the upstarts when we started. They all had 15 in, in a class, and they were, you know, like they were very happy with that. Uh, from the very outset, we thought, no, we'll have six in the class, uh, and that's going to guarantee that uh, everyone's going to be speaking a lot, it guarantees, apart from everything else, that we can have a very well-streamed groups, um, which again is something that uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, are not able to be in that situation. Now, we chose six, but that, if you like, is purely uh, a policy that as a school we decided to adopt. Having said that, uh, over the last few months, I have been teaching in different situations uh, not inside our school physically, but I've been teaching groups of uh, 15. Uh, in a, that was in a, a diploma course in logistics, uh, an institution, uh, an educational institution outside uh, here in Verona. I taught a group of 12 uh, farmers, and I also taught uh, 12 other people in a, in a very different situation as well. Um, yeah, so. Obviously, if a group of 12 can work, a group of 15 can work, as long as, of course, that people are aware of how to benefit from the lesson. Uh, if everyone's trying to butt in and, uh, or, or what have you, you know, these are the sort of behavioral problems that perhaps uh, are likely to be could exaggerated by a large group. But once roles are established and once people understand how the, the lesson works, because there are three kind of frameworks of, of how the how, how method works, um, you know, you, people can actively be involved and can learn uh, very well also in a larger group. It's a preference from students to be in smaller groups. Um, like again, really, 15, I wouldn't really want to go beyond 15. Um, we're lucky enough here that we're able to, to, to guarantee six. Um, so the answer to that question is 
there is a huge advantage uh, to everyone by having uh, smaller groups, whether that be five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, but for this sort of approach, um, if someone chooses this sort of approach because they do want to improve their speaking skills, they do want to feel comfortable at ease with the language, uh, that's going to happen more easily if they're in a group of a, a containable and a, a manageable size. Ian, thank you. I presume that your experience is mainly with uh, students who are native speakers of Italian. Am I correct? Or have you had experience with other languages uh, as first language? No, no, I have had experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, here, of course, working in Italy, most of our students are Italian, but there are, you know, several, over the years, many students who are not Italian. Uh, I have taught with this in, in other countries. Uh, I've taught with this uh, in multilingual situations. I, 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 several years ago, I had the chance to do, to do this in London, and there were students there, mixed groups, largely mixed groups, 8, 10, 12, 13, 14 people, uh, and a group which might contain seven or eight different nationalities. So, very, yeah, it's not designed uh, specifically for Italian speakers. And quite lately, again, I was teaching in a situation uh, just up until, <laughs> unfortunately, I was unable to, um, <laughs> so I broke my leg, I was unable to continue. I was teaching a group of, I think we had five or six different nationalities in the same group. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, it's more interesting to, to teach in those sorts of situations. Uh, and the appeal, again, this is again something that uh, is important. The appeal kind of cuts across national bar barriers. You know, um, whenever I go to another country, the teachers you speak to all seem very concerned that the, the students in their country are somehow unique and, and very different from students in other countries. You speak to uh, an Italian school teacher and they'll say, oh, well, Italians aren't very good at uh, learning to speak English. Uh, you know, they, they need grammar or what have you. You go to Russia, you speak to a Russian teacher and they'll say, oh, Russian students are not very good at learning to speak, they, they, they need grammar. Uh, and you go to Poland and the teachers will you, you say the same thing. Um, <laughs> so probably t teaching traditions do tend to be fairly similar uh, in many, many countries. Um, but as I said earlier, Again, I, I've simply found that people very widely do respond to similar sorts of things. Uh, people like to be involved when they're, they're learning. Uh, they like an element of fun, of stimulation. They like an element of, of serious hard work because nobody wants to waste time. That's another of these perhaps sort of semi-universal things that very few people do want to waste time. So if you have an approach uh, that is like I said, it's intuitively attractive to, to most people, um, then it, it does cut across uh, borders. And uh, certainly for a teacher, it's very interesting, obviously, to be, and for students too, to be in a situation where everyone's not from the same town, because they have the same sets of knowledge as well, you see. So, of course, if people are finding out about each other, uh, it, it, there's more curiosity uh, in the lesson. And, of course, curiosity, I think, is... Uh, a very important part of learning. So it's, it's good to encourage people to be to be curious, and that's you know that's harder. Say if you're teaching in a, a course in a bank, whether it's in Tokyo or Los Angeles, where you're teaching a bunch of colleagues who know each other perhaps better than they really want to. Um, maybe there's not a lot of room for, for curiosity there. So again, sorry, another rather rambling answer to that question. Uh, so yeah, I have taught. Uh, people from lots of other countries. In fact, very recently, yesterday perhaps, I'm getting <laughs> busy, but on Monday uh, I taught uh, a lady from Syria and a lady from Ukraine. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to have these opportunities sometimes, uh, and they were both extremely enjoyable Thank experiences you. for me. And I hope about... too. Uh, first language and whether non-native speakers or at least teachers who know the first language uh, are able to cope better with the class, at least a beginner's class. There's this, um, I don't know if it's a misconception, but it's what a lot of teachers think. 
And here's Christina. She says, what happens when the beginners and the teacher don't speak uh, the first language? Uh-huh. Well, again, I'm talking about a situation I've had experience of this uh, lately. Again, this group of, of, of 12 people I was teaching from different nationalities, most of those were complete beginners. Um, some of them had some rudimentary Italian, but many didn't. Uh, and, and of course, the course is designed to, well, okay, of course, but the course is designed to work from beginner level onwards. I think here, Okay, there's sort of the strategies you use in the classroom, that's one thing, so probably the content, the procedures, the methodology. Uh, largely, at the very beginning, it's a question of trust. Uh, I think, you know, people do feel vulnerable initially. Um, so if they know there's someone who does appreciate the difficulties that they're facing, uh, someone who really does know what they're feeling, uh, that's largely, uh, if you like, that's largely what's going to help you overcome potential problems at a beginner level. So, if the common language is there, that's an obvious advantage um, because the teacher can sort of, even before beginning lesson, can actually talk to the students and say, listen, I know what you're feeling, you know, I know what you are going to be finding difficult but we're going to go about it in such and such a way uh, that those you'll soon see that, that those fears will evaporate. Um, so initially, I think there are advantages purely in terms of, um, if you like, the welfare of, of the students rather than the practicalities of, of, of teaching vocabulary of, of, of you know, the, kind of the, the you know, didactic side of things a little bit falls into second place if there is that sense of, of trust. Um, so that's probably easier in, in a situation where the students have something in common with the teacher. Um, you know, the teacher is able to be sympathetic and isn't looking blankly uh, when they're sort of asking questions, which perhaps have to do with the procedure of the lesson or the nature of the language itself. Um, but so, I wouldn't agree, I think, you know, well, I mean, I'm going to say something very obvious, but a sort of a, an unsympathetic native speaking teacher, for example, if, you know, if, 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 if teachers in Poland are given their Polish students because it's seen as an, ex as an advantage, uh, but that's an, you know, that teacher happens to be unsympathetic, uh, that's not preferable to having uh, a teacher who doesn't teach Polish, who is enabled uh, to sort of communicate the sense of, of, of common interest, consensus, and, and trust. Um, so, yeah, yeah I think, like I anything think, else, thank there's you. no I think trust is flat and white uh, answer to that. the best way to go. If you can, uh, you know, bridge, as someone said, bridge the uh, connection, you know, between the teacher and student, I think that, that's the best way um, to go. Thank you. Uh, there's another question that I asked before. If you can look at the chat box, there are questions coming in. But the question that I asked, was how do you sell or do you sell in fact your uh, your method uh, what's the business line how can teachers uh, connect partner and so on with you okay yeah well really the whole sort of that side of things has sort of really evolved be, not say despite what I've been doing here, really. Um, to be quite honest, when I started all this work, and there's been a lot of work over the last 20 years, and it's, it was, I'm not saying it's all for my own benefit or the benefit of my students, but that was what drove me, uh, along with perhaps, like I said, the sense of curiosity. Over the years, people have found out about us, and in fact, this is something that people often mention, that we are very hard to find out about. Uh, you know, and they perhaps come along, they looked and so on, uh, and they decided to adopt the, the method for their own schools. So, slowly initially, but that's accelerating a little bit, uh, we have actually developed this sort of network of associate schools. Now, what we do is simply that we, we work 
uh, under uh, a licensing agreement. Partly, again, I'll say this, uh, you know, no offence meant to anyone at all, um, but as anybody who has been a student of English uh, and who has looked for courses, I mean, it, and it's, the unfortunate truth is there are an awful lot of schools who I certainly wouldn't recommend. And unfortunately, I found that, you know, my experience in Italy, my experience in the UK. Um, so rather make it sort of freely available for everyone, uh, and as a result, being out, unable to sort of maintain the kind of core values that we have, um, and I'm talking about, uh, you know, the values, if you like, the kind of didactic values as, as a teaching method, but also we do want to sort of represent an ethically sound school. Um, so what, what happens is that we do kind of work with selected schools uh, uh, who will then be sort of licensed to, to, to use the uh, use the your mind. We, we cover training, we do all those aspects, they will get exclusivity for their area, also to protect them, because if someone has invested their faith, uh, as well as their effort and, and money, uh, and because there are, there are things involved uh, in us, okay, that, that is fair enough, but then they should be sort of protected from the unscrupulous people who want to jump on the bandwagon and perhaps uh, take advantage of other people would work. So yeah, we do have, we operate under this system, it's a kind of a licensing system, there is a network of, of schools, um, uh, so we're, there is a sort of community, if you like, that, um, that we're trying to create. Um, and that's what the phase we're kind of entering now. Uh, so we have been pretty hard to find out about, so I'm hoping that that will, will change and, and maybe this will kind of help us on, on the way towards that. Um, but yes, that, that we would get approached by schools, we often have very long dialogues, we've had sort of conversations with people which may have lasted years, uh, and then it comes to fruition. Um, so I suppose we're a bit, I mean, we, we, we get kind of fairly regular contacts, and some people we just feel kind of good about, uh, you know, and the trust is there, we mentioned trust before, right. so, you know, um, a lot of it is based on, <laughs> on that. Um, have you seen some of the questions? Uh, there's been a question about you yeah. need to make a living, uh, teachers need to make a living, and so on. But how, how can teachers uh, or schools connect? Yeah. How do they find you? Is there a link or uh, just through email? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's the website, which uh, everyone is very more than welcome to, to look at, and hopefully you'll find lots of interesting sort of information on that. Um, I, we've been contacted, it's been sort of word of mouth, largely. I mean, we are mentioned, we come up in a couple of, sort of uh, uh, forums, website uh, forums that mention us and say things, people have come across that. Um, but yeah, now that is our role now. I mean, we, we do really want to sort of... Uh, to be able to to, to expand this, uh, so our priorities now really are. I mean, after, like I said in the introduction on, on, on the page, there it's been a very very long incubation period of work, basically. So um, we can emerge from that a little bit now and become a bit more visible. But anyway, by only oh good, someone's put oh <laughs> well done. Uh, yeah, so th th that's the website. Um, there's a YouTube channel, and we're, we're sort of relative newcomers in terms of uh, of, uh, of of marketing and so on. But that's we're, we're making steps towards changing that. I mean, one thing that we are looking at is to is to be able to get a, a school in in the UK. But that obviously uh, that's Ian, important for lots of reasons. Thank you. And that uh, Ian, can you be a, uh, see you know, the, uh, the screen? Are you able to see that? Okay. Hello. Oh, is it? Okay, tell me when it, uh, I can see. when it, you recognize it's I can, I can, It's all black at the moment. On the black. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. For some reason. Um, yeah, I nothing think else yet, I'm flash afraid. Base. Maybe you don't have the updated version of uh, Flash. Yeah, I seem to have. Uh, that's the only reason I... Okay, so what what I've put on the screen is actually uh, uh, this is your the, website. Uh, 
speak your mind. The no, I, I couldn't tell you that. Drink, but everyone can see it. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you can't see it. But I think it's a wonderful oh. front page, landing page uh -huh. Uh -huh. of um, of the site because uh -huh. it's very clear. I went through it. The navigation is excellent, and there's also the video. Uh, so uh, I think this is something that um, can you see it now by any chance? All right, okay, all right. Yeah. No, I'll tell you, it's got about I the message. The, middle, but, uh, the only thing that's missing is that I would like to see, I went through it, is up. your name. Um, you must be very modest. I, I don't think people realize that from a website such as this, if I don't see the person behind it, <laughs> In other words, uh, even the about, it says the People Speak Your Mind is a young, completely independent organization. Everyone in, everything is here but uh -huh. your name. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, I'm very kind of opposed to, like you said, there's probably a degree of modesty there, uh, but it's, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of kind of methods and things around there that you know seem to be based well, on the kind of I, the cult of personality. Yeah, uh, I collect and I'm very myself. suspicious it, of all it, those sort of things. So a little bit, but probably it's that little. accounts for you it know, as well. I wanted to, um, but okay, add a little mention for that. I created and I just, Sorry? you know, I felt like, you know, why be in hiding? You know, something a little more about you would certainly uh, have helped me. Okay, um, great. But I guess you're modest. And then it says the teachers. Okay, in the teachers sections, you know, I checked this out too. I expected to see your name here, and I still didn't see it. So, uh, Ian, you are. I'm back to class. I stopped sharing. You are very modest. Oh, well, yeah, I could go out of that, I guess, if things kind of really take off, but no, no, yeah, it's, it's, it's like I said, I think it's a suspicion of sort of, uh, you know, the, and you probably know many courses yourself, which is kind of like highlight the name of the individual who supposedly to, um, kind of speak to you about created that, it, what have you, and you know, I don't know what the emphasis to be on, you know, on that really. Uh, so. Because in the online world, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't... that's okay. I was just saying that your online presence. No, no, no. Sorry, I didn't. I forgot, I forgot my uh, etiquette. World. I forgot. So I couldn't teach speak face while you face. were speaking. Can you share a little bit about your uh, future thoughts about, say, using WizIQ for uh, people who cannot come to your school or don't have the ability to join face-to-face -face classes? Okay. Now, yeah, that obviously that's something you know that has been we've been thinking about. Uh, it hasn't been the, the first thought on our minds because literally, I mean, the work on the material. I mean, there's an awful lot of material. I mean, there's the written teaching material with about three thousand pages worth of material, uh, and that's been sort of in constant development and review for, for all these years. And that sort of final review actually didn't sort of stop. Uh, until September of uh, 